Amen. Thank you so much for that duet and all of our music this morning. Fantastic. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we come today. We've sung praises to your name that are inadequate as best we know how, but still fall short of the depth, the magnitude of your glory. And now, Lord, we turn to your word. We pray that you'd speak so very clearly to us that we would get a glimpse, a picture, stand in awe of who you are, majestic, mighty, triumphant, and yet personal and tender. Lord, I pray that we would respond to your word today in the ways that you know that we need to, that you'd take your word and you would apply it specifically to each of our lives. As we pray for sister churches, we pray for Promise Community Church, that you would equip them, provide for them, use them here in Albuquerque. And as we pray for one of our missionaries, we pray for Angela in Thailand, that she would have a deep and restful sleep and that her week would be effective for your kingdom, that you'd protect her physically and spiritually. You'd meet her physical and emotional, spiritual needs, and you'd use her greatly today. And Lord, now get glory by the presentation of your word, but more specifically, by the receiving and the applying of your word. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Take your copy of God's word and turn to Isaiah 40. We will be in this beautiful chapter for the next few weeks. Isaiah chapter 40 today will be in verses 1 through 11. Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 11. was 2004, and baby Bethany was a baby. That's kind of why we called her baby Bethany, because she was a baby. But um, we were in Nagasaki, Japan, and we, were, we knew that we were being transferred to Sapporo, Japan. Uh, we had, the Lord had allowed some folks to come to Christ, and there was a couple, a Japanese couple, who had initially agreed that the... the house church that had been started could meet in their apartment. And then just a week before we were to move, they told us, no, we can't do that. Many cultural things happening and, and, uh, there, but they were struggling uh, with it. And so then we were uh, in a big struggle because we were indeed moving in a week. And so baby Bethany, uh, doing what babies would do, she, uh, she woke up a few times during the night, and I didn't know that Kathy was doing this. She didn't know that I was doing this, but every time the, that uh, the baby woke us up, we were both crying out to the Lord, Lord, would you, would you speak to Kenji and to Hiromi? Would you, would you do what only you can do to help them to change their minds and to be able to step out in faith and to host, receive this house church into their house? We woke up the next morning, then we found out the other had been doing the same, and so Kathy called Hiromi, and she said, hey, good morning. By the way, did God speak to you last night? We didn't know that at the exact same moment, uh, there was a prayer guide back in the States, and, and that day, the prayer request that many Southern Baptists were praying was asking God to speak to Asians in their dreams. Well, God did. He spoke to Hiromi, and she said, God knows Japanese. Well, we, we weren't... <laughs> We weren't surprised. Um, now, there's a cultural thing. When Americans have a dream about something, we assume it was bad pizza, you know, or something there. But around the world, there, there, there are many cultures that, that pay attention to dreams. But God gave her two chapters in the Bible in her dream. And, of course, both of those chapters had to do with not fearing man but fearing God. But it's interesting, number one, and this is... The big theme today is that God speaks. I mean, we know that, that, that phrase, but God speaks. Amen. The creator God, the God who spoke the world into existence out of nothing. The God who rules and reigns and is triumphant, has endless power, endless wisdom. That God speaks. He didn't just speak in the past, he speaks today. Now, it's interesting too, as we'll see today, even in Hiromi's case there. He spoke, but it was attached to his word, because this is the way that he continually speaks. 
And God speaks, he uses many different things. Oh, he uses music. We're thankful for it. He may use art. I'm not much of an artist, so I, I don't know about that. I'm not sure how that works. My stick figures don't even have necks. But he speaks in many ways, but it's always attached to his word. In this day and age, even in the church, you'll, you'll hear teaching about how God spoke a new thing through this or that. No, no. He does speak in many ways, but it's always according to the finished revelation of the Lord. But let's look at this wonderful, wonderful thing in Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah writes the word of the Lord to Judah and, there, and then also to us. Comfort. Oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her <clears throat> that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice is calling. Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, call out. And then he answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. First, I'd just like for you to look at with me this, this first point that he never stops speaking. He never stops. In the situation we find here in Isaiah, <clears throat> Isaiah is writing. He's delivering the prophecy that God has given him for Judah specifically. At this point in time, Israel and Judah are divided. Israel is divided into what we call Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom. And Israel is already in the process of falling to the Assyrians, but Judah has not yet fallen to the Babylonians, although it's coming. They'll fall in 586 B.C. But Isaiah is writing over 100 years before the fall. And he's writing the first 39 chapters of Isaiah. He's writing with warning and prophecy. Oh, Judah, have you not learned? You're turning away from God. You're turning to idolatry over and over, and God has given you chance after chance after chance to repent and turn back, but you're not, and so you will fall. You will fall to Babylon. And Isaiah, of course, is such a, a masterful, wonderful book. It's divided. It has 66 chapters, just like the 66 books of the Bible. It's divided at 39 and 27, just like the Old and the New Testament and Isaiah 40, is not only a pivotal turning point in the book of Isaiah, but really in the whole Bible. I love this chapter. You love this chapter. But it's at Isaiah 40 that, that God begins to send, although they won't read it for another hundred years until they're in captivity, in exile, a message of hope. And he says, comfort, comfort my people says your God. The word comfort here means to breathe again. Are you out of breath? You may be like Judah was here, and maybe you're, you're experiencing the consequences for your sin. No good parent raises a child without some sort of consequences for the child's own good, and certainly God 
allows consequences in our life because he loves us, because the consequences are to drive us back to him. The consequences aren't to push us away, but to drive us in. And so God has allowed in the life of Judah this exile into Babylon. But he says even there that they will read these words while still in exile. He says, I want you to breathe again. Speak to my people. And the construction of the verse here, the construction of the wording in the Hebrew here says that he says, keep speaking comfort. Don't stop telling my people they can breathe again. Comfort my people. I love in Isaiah, just a couple of chapters later in 43, 1, at the second half of the verse, he says, I have called you by name. You are mine. Are you his? If we're in covenant with him, as Judah was in covenant with him, then the covenant can never be broken. He will never, never let go of his end of the covenant. If you have come to know Christ as your Savior, then you are in covenant with him. And you will be his forever and ever. You can't become someone's child and then not be their child. Have you come to know him today? Do you not just believe there's a God, not just have church membership somewhere, but have you personally come to the place where you've said, yes, God, you're right, I am a sinner. And yes, I need a Savior. And therefore, I want to ask you what Jesus did on the cross. Would you apply that to my life? Forgive my sin. And I want to enter into covenant with you. I won't keep my end perfectly. You will. But I'm not just checking off a religious box. But I want to know you. I want you to live inside of me. I want to become a Christ follower. And then you are in covenant with him. And he would say about you, whatever your situation, whether it's your fault as we do, again, experience the consequences for our sin because he loves us. Or maybe you're in some other situation today and you'd say, best I know, this is just something the Lord is allowing in my life. God would say to you, I never stop speaking to you. Comfort, comfort, breathe again. My people, says our God. In verse 2, he says, speak kindly to Jerusalem. It means to speak to the heart of Jerusalem. He say, my people, they're in exile. They're hurting. Speak to their heart. Appeal to their heart as God does for us. Call out to her that her warfare has ended. Warfare, time of difficulty. Her iniquity has been removed. She's received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. God says, yeah, I, I, I let these consequences come into your life. And the course has been played out. Received double for her sins. Does this mean that the Lord gave her too much? No. The Lord's judgment in my life, in your life, is nothing compared to his mercy. His mercy is always so much more than his judgment and the consequences He says, it's over. You can have hope. They would be there some 70 years, and he would bring them back. It's been paid. Now, this word is to a nation. No individual ever pays for our own sin. We never hear the Lord say, you've paid for your sin. No, because we can't. The Lord in his holiness and his perfection There's only one way that sin can be atoned for, that sin can be paid for, and that's what's coming next. There's only one who could accomplish that, and that's this next section, verses 3 through 8. Just uh, hear that the Lord is saying that He promises to come. He never stops speaking, but secondly, He promises to come. It says in verse 3, a voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. There's the desert. Did you know you're in the Bible? Did you know we're in the Bible? A lot of things happen in the desert in the Bible. His people were in bondage earlier in Egypt, and he came through the desert to rescue and redeem them and to bring them home. And he says, I will come again through the desert to bring you home from Babylon back to Jerusalem. I will come, clear the way, prepare the way, 
in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert. Let every valley be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low, and let the rough ground become a plain, and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Because I'm coming. When the President of the United States comes to any city, any president, just like our current president did last month, the planning process is months and months ahead of the visit. Incredible detail in the advance team. When he comes, the airport closes, as you found out. When he comes, the highways that he will travel are closed down to everyone else. The hotel in which he stays, it's closed down for blocks around. And he, like you and I, just like us, he's a man. But there's one coming, he says here, that the advance team necessary for the coming of the Lord God Almighty is indescribable. And he says, not just roads, not just airports, mountains made low, valleys raised up. As I read this and studied, it's like the reverse of what happened in the flood. In the flood, the mountains rose up and the valleys were made low, and it's the reverse process there. But he's just trying to paint a picture of the magnitude of the severity of being prepared for the coming of the Lord. And am I prepared for his coming? He will come again. Where will he find me? He told the parable of the steward of the house. He said, if he'd have known when the master was coming home, he would have been ready. And the point was, be ready. If you know Christ as your Savior, you truly know him, you've been born again. It's not just a religious experience that you had, but but, but he lives in you. You're a follower of Christ. You're going home with him. But let's not have it be an embarrassing encounter, he's saying. Let's be ready. And maybe today you're in a form of exile because the covenant's not broken, the Lord's still speaking But you need to come and be ready. He wants to bring you home. But he may be waiting for you to repent. I was reading just this morning in my Bible reading in Ezekiel chapter 11. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, though I had removed them far away among the nations, and though I had scattered them among the countries, yet I was a sanctuary for them, even in exile. You remember the story with King David and Solomon, Absalom. Absalom had disappointed his father. And then Absalom was eventually brought near to live near his father, but his father refused to reach out to him. There was a separation there because of what Absalom had done. And though David was appealed to to reach out to his son, he didn't do it. He allowed the displeasure to make a distance between them. But our God doesn't do that. Even in his displeasure, he says, even though I've sent you away among the other countries, even though I've allowed consequence in your life, I'm still a sanctuary for you while in the countries where they had gone. Therefore say, thus says the Lord our God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries among which you have been scattered. And I will give you the land of Israel when they come there. They will remove all its detestable things and all its abominations from it. And I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. And I will take the heart of stone out of them, out of their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. And then they will be my people and I shall be their God. Perhaps today there's a readiness that you need to do. There's a a preparation you need to make. You say, God, I'm thankful that you speak to me. Yes, I want to be brought back, not to Jerusalem physically. I want to be brought back into that close fellowship with you. And he says, you think you do. I long for you to come back. But we have to turn. His love will keep us in the consequence until we turn and we remove the things that we know need to be removed. And then he says in verse 5, and then when we have become repentant, when, when Judah was repentant, when the time was right, he says, the preparations have been made, then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And we say, yeah, 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 we sing about that, glory, glory, glory. No, no. He says, 
you don't even know. This is what you need. This is what the earth needs, the glory of the Lord revealed. Oh, God, show us a glimpse of your glory, of who you are. And he says, it won't be secret. All flesh will see it together. And John the Baptist used this text to apply it to the coming of Christ in the incarnation when Jesus left the glories of heaven to come. It's, it's, it's beautiful. I love the Old Testament prophecies and the multiple fulfillments of them. He's giving a promise to God's people who are in exile that he would come. But he's also looking ahead, and John the Baptist, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, would ap- aptly apply this to the coming of Christ, make preparation for the Christ, the Messiah, God in flesh will come. It's also uh, for us coming to Christ, that that Christ would come to us as we have repented of our sin, admitted that we're sinners so that Christ might forgive us and come and live in our hearts. But that's not all. It's also looking ahead to the second coming. He is coming again. He says, I will come. And he's coming for those who know him as their Savior. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. He's saying, "You, you don't need any other assurances. I've said it. When God makes promises, he keeps them. And then a voice calls out. And he says, what should I call out? And then we enter into this beautiful section about where do we receive the promises? Okay, God speaks. Okay, if he speaks and promises to come, he'll do so. Where do we read all of these things? He says, all flesh is grass. And all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers. The flower fades. I mean, grass and flowers are fragile. I've been trying with very limited success for two years to grow grass in my backyard. And most of the fault is mine with half measures, but it's very fragile. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, oh, the breath of the Lord can give life. The breath of the Lord can heal. The breath of the Lord can destroy. The breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. And certainly there was a reminder here to his people in exile. Your captors, the Babylonians, they too are fragile and like grass when the Lord blows his breath upon them. And you, your enemy, the devil, he's already lost. Genesis 3.15 says that Jesus would crush him under his foot. And he has done so on the cross and the resurrection. He's been declared the loser. He's just still taking swings on the way out of the ring. If you know Christ, you're set free from that captor. In verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. The word of our God stands forever. His word that he would come and rescue Judah. His word that he would come in the incarnation. His word that he would save you from his sin, your sin. And his word that he's coming again. And he will take us to the new Jerusalem. And he will march through that spiritual desert. And everything will be out of the way. And every mountain will be made low. Every valley will be raised up. Every rough place will be made smooth. And the highway will be prepared for him. Because he has promised. So are we in his word? All of these promises, truths, it's not a revelation of God. It's not that the Word of God is contained in the Scriptures. It is the revelation of God to me, to you. And I'm afraid that in some of your homes, it has dust on it. Friends, you have got to do whatever it takes to establish the discipline of being in the Word of God. You have got to. The crisis comes crashing in, and if you haven't been in the Word of God, you've got to first get to know God again. Whereas if you have been in His Word, you you know Him. You know how He thinks. You know how to pray because you know His words. You know what He thinks. You know what He wants. You've got to be in His Word. You're operating life, and you've never opened the operating manual today. You've got to. I just, I can't appeal to you enough. Whatever it takes to make it a daily discipline in your life. And if you miss a day, don't quit. Get back on it. 
Get accountability. Get a friend. You say, just when you see me on Sunday, just ask, did you read the word this week? Something simple. Don't eat breakfast before you read the word. Whatever it takes. I can't appeal to you enough. We've got to be in the word. We don't come here on Sunday just to get our word fix. We come here to celebrate what God's already been doing in our lives. Or else we're just starting over every week. Be in the word. Everything else passes away. But the word of God stands forever. And in this final closing, the mighty God is a tender shepherd. He says, get yourself up on high mount, on a high mountain, O Zion of Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God, to declare the coming of this mighty king. We're the only ones that know the truth. Not Sandia Baptist Church, but believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're the only ones that know the answers. And sometimes we, bef- we, we, we bemoan the, the, the ruin, the fall of our society. And yet we're not telling anybody the answers. Of course the world is going to act like lost people if they don't know Christ. We've got the news. He says, don't hide it. Declare it in Albuquerque. Declare it in Japan where we have a partnership. Declare it in Cambodia where we will likely soon have a partnership. Declare it in Russia where we have one of our own as missionary. Declare it. Gospel tracts, your testimony, asking a coworker, how can I pray for you? Something. Ask God, what's the first step I could take to be, to be becoming a Christian? who declares it. Don't get overwhelmed by it. Start with the little steps. Declare it, he says. And what do we declare? Verse 10, behold, in this beautiful picture of the mighty ruling God, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him, his recompense before him. There will be reward. There will be punishment coming. The mighty God is coming, and he's coming again. And then the beautiful, beautiful contrast here. That mighty God. And we need to recapture the the mightiness, the power of God. He's not just soft and pretty. He's not just precious moments. He is the God with his breath who can destroy everything. The God who will destroy this earth. But yet, simultaneously, he says he's like a shepherd. And he tends his flock. In his arm, he will gather his lambs. You, he'll carry them close to his chest. And those nursing ewes, the ones who are helpless, yeah, he'll gently lead them. We've got to always have this contrast. We've got to always understand because we don't appreciate it otherwise. That the mighty God, read your Old Testament. Read of his power. Read, as I did recently, how he destroyed 186,000 Assyrians in one night with no help. Read how he separates the seas. Read how he's able to protect his own from the fiery furnace and from the lion's den. And read how he destroys army after army and nation after nation. And then you appreciate that that God lets me come and pray to him each morning. That God listens to me and to you. He, he doesn't just allow us to pray. He wants us to pray. He doesn't allow us to know him. He wants us to know him. He woos you. He entreats you. He does everything to make it possible for you to walk closely with him. Don't waste it. Well, there's so much more. 
So we pray, God, fill us with your spirit. God, help us to know you more and more so that we're not just clicking off the days. We're not just going through the motions. We're not just seeing how we can contract for a C in the Christian life. But we're saying, I want more. I want all that God has for me so that my life can count, so I can get to the end and say, yeah, imperfect, forgiven sinner, sure, but I left it all on the field. I experienced what the great men of old, the great men and women of the scriptures experienced because I made ready for the Lord and I sought to know him and I welcomed his coming and I knew his promises in his word. Well, God has spoken to you today, spoken to me in ways that I didn't have planned. God just did some things with his word that I don't know about. But today, will you respond to him? Will will you not let as the enemy would want you to say, that's neat, Pastor, way to go, good job. I mean, maybe you'd say that, I don't know, but, and then just move on. Would you just stop and respond to God? He's, he's spoken to you. There's some steps he wants you to take. There's some promises he wants you to receive. There's some things he wants you to be reminded of again today and to dwell on. Some of you need to know Christ as your Savior, and you'd come today and say, I want to know that God. I mean, I don't want to know about him. I don't want to just believe he exists. I want to know him. And we'd be delighted to show you how. Some of you, God said, you've been here for a while. This is your church. Let's make it official today. Some of you need to follow the Lord in believers' baptism. We'll be baptizing next week. We'll be baptizing again first Sunday in December. And you need to just come and say, I want to, I'm tired of being a private, secret Christian. I want to go, go forward publicly in my faith. And then there are countless ways God's spoken to you. Whether you need to come and pray at this altar, do business with God where you're at, let's be responders today to what God has said to us. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. These promises that are so wonderful for me, for each of us. Oh, Lord God Almighty, move today in our hearts. Help us to be people who say yes to you and respond to you. I pray that there'd be those who'd come today and say, I want to know Jesus for sure as my Savior. Who'd come and say, I want to follow him in believer's baptism. I want to make this my church home for this time in my life. Or any number of ways that you'd move. Help us to not leave this place without responding to you with a yes. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.